Hi everyone, my name is Daryl Payne, CEO of As Good As Gold Australia. And this evening, once again, I'm joined by my brother Brian. Thank you, Brian. Partner As Good As Gold. And tonight we interview Head of Research at Gold Money, Alastair McLeod. Good evening, Alastair. Good evening, Alastair. Good, good morning. Yeah, I mean, look, there isn't anybody here really in Australia that that we could interview of any significance, is there? Well, it, no, well, otherwise we would. It, yeah. Look, if, if we had great economists over here, the Australia would be doing a lot better. You know, so yeah, we don't have we don't have them, so we have to uh, take our interviews from uh, overseas. And uh, as much as uh, and a good economist. Uh, sh- uh, helps the country to bring it to their I, I, good ideas. Unfortunately, not many countries actually will listen to them. Hmm. But we listen to Alistair McLeod simply because his common sense and economic knowledge is second to none. And I'm really honest in saying that. I love Alistair. I listen to on his on the King World News. I listen to wherever I can hear or listen to uh, Alistair. I will do so. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Well. Now look, yeah, we're we're honoured. That, uh, that Al- Alastair yeah. is... Uh, things. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm flattered. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Alastair, look, uh, of late, uh, and, you know, over the last couple of months in particular, there's been strong reference, of course, to this raising of the debt ceiling. Uh, it's just been an ongoing issue um, where... America keeps running out of dollars, and to pay the bills, of course, they've got to keep raising that debt that uh, debt ceiling limit. But a couple of people that have made reference to uh, to this problem, and uh, uh, and and how it would pan out. Ray Dalio, one of the oh, very wealthy men in the world, eighteen point four billion dollars net worth. Um, he, he wrote an article just recently, and he said this. He said, there is a disastrous financial collapse coming. Uh, and he, he goes on to say, raising the US $31.4 trillion debt limit without fixing the issue at large is a kicking the can further down the road type solution that will eventually lead to a disastrous financial collapse. Now, he's a billionaire and he's Bridgewater's founder, very, very smart man, and and clearly knows what he's talking about. He goes on to say, increasing the debt limit the way Congress and presidents have repeatedly done and most likely will do this time around. Now, it's interesting because this was written a few days ago before there was a change in policy that took place. Will mean there will be no meaningful limit on the debt. This will eventually lead to a disastrous financial collapse. Now, then James Turk, who you, and you're very closely connected with James, wrote an article for King World News. He said, um, and he made reference to the suspension. Now, it's a suspension here, and we want your view on the suspension versus raising the ceiling. But... So he went on to say the debt ceiling suspension was similar to Nixon taking the U.S. off the gold standard. Now, this is a really powerful statement. Yeah. Okay, because we know what happened when President Nixon took the U.S. off the gold standard. We know what, temporarily, of course, <coughs> we, we know what happened there. We know what happened in the powerful bull run, the, the gold, bull, precious metals bull run yeah. from 71 through to 1980. And... James Turk is likening it to that era. Yeah. So he goes on to say, the monetary system is broken. The evidence supporting the conclusion continues to mount ranging from the recent episode of negative interest rates to relentless, never-ending inflation. These are not normal conditions. They result solely from government policies and central banks that serves the aims of politicians rather than the people. Discipline is the key ingredient. This is really important because with the gold standard, it was disciplinary, wasn't it? Yeah, on government. Absolutely. Which is why they went off the gold standard. It's the key ingredient that is missing. There is no discipline in the creation of new dollars, which was the most important reason for tying currencies to gold. 
as prevailed through history and more, um, and more or less up until 1971. The US debt limit was intended to provide some discipline, but it has become like the link to gold that has been abandoned. An uncomfortable constraint on the spending aspirations of politicians and their desire for even bigger government. It is important to recognise that the debt limit hasn't just been raised, this time it has been suspended. It reminds me of President Nixon's declaration on August 1571 to suspend temporarily the dollar's link to gold. Could we be looking, Alastair, at a repeat of 1971 through to 1980? Your thoughts? Um, yeah, it's, it's a good question. Um, I'm not quite sure that that's what James was referring to. I think what he was saying is that this is an important event. I don't think, you know, if you like, on the scale of uh, the 1971 suspension of the Bretton Woods uh, Agreement, um, the way I look at it, this is, you know, it's serious. Um, we could take the view that this is the, what, 79th or 90th time that the debt limit has been raised since, yeah. you know, a debt limit was put in place. Um, and therefore, so what? But um, as Ray Dalio was um, saying in the quote that you uh, uh, um, repeated, uh, you know, this can't go on forever. Uh, and um, we're now in a situation where, yet again, um, this debt limit is just a complete joke. Uh, it's it, 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 That's the only way to describe it. And my understanding is that um, so far, the reason why this appears to be going through, and it hasn't quite gone through yet, is that the spending um, is, uh, you know, sort of angled, if you like, in a sense that... Um, uh, uh, senators and congressmen uh, in their um, uh, patches so that, um, you know, they're going to support it. And, you know, in other words, they're being bought off by um, the inflation of, of the currency at the central bank level. Uh, and uh, I mean, I think I think in the past when uh, America's military might um, and her skill at deploying the dollar financially around the world basically kept everybody in line. The foreigners basically accepted these uh, increases in uh, the debt limit um, without too much concern, without too much objection, if you like. But the situation now is actually very, very different. Um, and uh, America's power around the world financially um, has become considerably limited. And uh, militarily, um, it is also threatened because you've got a wholesale revolt amongst countries who are no longer prepared to toe the line and accept only dollars in payment for um commodities in payment for exports and all the rest of it. So uh, this is now, I think, a very fragile situation. And it takes me back to um, uh, this time last year when um, uh, uh, we had the St. Petersburg um, Financial Forum. Um, that was June last year. And, uh, you, you know, Putin stood up at that forum and said, um, you know why hold these you know these currencies the the uh, you know our enemies currencies because they will just cut you off at the knees and this was a very widely attended conference so um i think this is the difference that i would draw uh between previous debt limit charades it's the only word for it mm. and the current one and that is i don't think this is going to be swallowed quite so readily by foreign holders of dollar deposits and um, also dollar, uh, you know, dollar financial assets. So, uh, yeah, I'm I'm with da uh, uh, Ray Dalio and I'm with James Turk in in the sense that um, this is, I think, potentially as serious as Nixon's suspension of um, uh, the Bretton Woods Agreement. Well, you know, I mean, it's I just see the pressure mounting. Um, you know, clearly, you've got uh, BRICS 
of course, uh, and we know, you know, their attitude towards uh, the US dollar. Um, and you've got Saudi Arabia now, um, who will be the next member of BRICS. And you've got another 33 countries that are um, keen to enter BRICS, become a member. And now you've got uh, this suspension. I mean, there's a lot of pressure mounting on the US, isn't there? I mean, it just how long can they continue to function effectively in that manner? They're losing... the. The US dollar is losing its dominance, no question at all about it. This is just going to add to it, isn't it? Yeah, uh, that's absolutely right. Um, and um, yeah, the situation is made more complex for us because there is so much disinformation going on out there. The basic uh, draw, if you like, away from the dollar is that China and Russia are planning a long-term industrial revolution throughout Asia and this is going to require substantial commodity inputs from around the world, as well as from Russia herself. Um, Saudi Arabia recognizes this, this, and this is yeah. why um, uh, Mohammed bin Salman, who um, is, if you like, uh, a very independent type. I mean, you know, as, as um, a member of the uh, Saudi uh, royal establishment, he was always sort of slightly on one side. The people who uh, were going to be um, the successors uh, to uh, the current king were likely to be very much America oriented. Um, but you may remember, I think it's what it, two or three years ago, Mohammed bin Salman effectively uh, engineered a coup d'etat. <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, he locked up his cousins and basically shook their profit. Their, pockets out until they coughed up, you know, lots of money. Uh, it was an extraordinary thing. Um, but having said that, there has been uh, an understanding in the Gulf Cooperation Council that the long term future is very much supplying energy to Asia and not so much to America. And I think this, in, uh, to a degree, was uh, rammed home when America invested uh, very substantially in shale oil production and uh, as a result became pretty much self-sufficient in in oil-based energy um i mean i noticed this going way back because i interviewed um, a director of one of the major swiss swiss refineries um uh, and this was in 2014 and he told me that they were taking in lbma 400 ounce bars from arab sources with instructions to uh, re-refine them into the new Chinese standard and then return them to um, where they, from whence the 400 ounce bars came. Now, yeah. this indicated quite clearly that there were forward thinkers at the highest level in mm -hmm. uh, the Gulf Cooperation Council. I mean, I, you know, I'd say it's not just Saudi Arabia, but, you know, you'd be looking at um, the individual sheikdoms uh, around the Gulf um yeah, they knew uh where their future lay and so they have been preparing for it i'm not saying that they would necessarily sell their gold uh which was why they were doing it and they were going to sell it into shanghai but it just made strategic sense to prepare for a world which as far as they're concerned was a world where uh china was probably going to be more important in the longer term than america and that's now coming true and mm. America has found it very difficult to adjust to this. Um, instead, what she tries to do is to destabilize Russia, um, which uh, unfortunately she's doing through this um, meat grinding. Um, it's a horrid phrase. Um, it's this meat grinding um, proxy war in, in uh, yeah. Ukraine. They're also stoking up um, the situation in the Pacific um, over China. And we're getting lots of propaganda about that. And my personal view is that for China, this is a very easy one to resolve. You just go along and talk to the Taiwanese you know, and say, look, you know, let's work together. You know, and the future might take care of itself. And what would happen is that um, at that stage, America would be completely cut out. Um, but I also noticed that 
um, you know, a rather desperate America is and alliance. I mean, you know, your country and, and, and my country is involved in this as members of the five eyes. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, they're now going into the Gulf to protect, um, uh, you know, if you like, oil transportation from ships which are not Iranian. Um, and um, I saw um, a news item on the BBC yesterday which said that the Iranians had um, refined more um, weapons-grade uranium um, in the last three months than they had before. And they've now added, you know, something, I don't know, an enormous quantity to their their, their, their tonnage. Now, um, this sort of news, um, I, call me cynical maybe, but this sort of news makes me think that someone's pushing a story um, because I don't know where this sort of information comes from, apart from intelligence sources. Now, the intelligence sources are the ones who are pushing the war machine, if you like. Yeah. Um, so, um, you know, I, their interest, I think, is basically to stir the pot. And um, if they try and um, have a go at Iran, you know, because we think, you know, they, 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 this whole thing is out of control and we've got to stop them or something, or we've got to provoke them, you know, into doing something, then I think they will find that they will have no friends in the Middle East at all. I mean, not that they had friends before, but at least, you know, the reality was that you had to be on side with the Americans. And mm, yeah. this was pre Mohammed bin Salman. It has fundamentally changed. So the whole um, uh, situation, geopolitical situation, uh, I think is getting more tense in the short term. I think it's probably going to ramp up in the next few months. Um, I hope nothing materializes in the Gulf, um, but I wouldn't rule it out. Uh, And I think, I mean, the feeling I get from my very few contacts in that part of the world is not only is that part of the world doing extremely well, thank you, there's a lot of Russian money in Dubai. I mean, I have contacts in uh, this sort of offshore financial services industry, and you wouldn't believe the amount of money that's being repackaged and all the rest of it uh, for uh, Russian interests. So um, that, I think, is important to understand. And I think also that um, very quietly, a lot of the members of the Gulf Cooperation Council are looking at a world post dollar reserve currency. They're looking at how they should keep their currency stable. Um, So, yeah, I mean, this is something which is effectively spitting in America's face. And I don't know there's an awful lot they can do about it. So to go back to your original, um, uh, uh, you know, quote from Ray Dalio and James Turk, um, this situation is hotting up. And I really don't think that um, the Americans' approach to their own finances is at all helpful. If anything, it's likely to precipitate something really rather nasty in the sense that, first of all, um, they will feel powerless on the money side, which basically means that they could ramp up things on the military side. And secondly, um, foreigners observing this um, are going to probably take the view that they want to get the hell out of the dollar as much as possible, or certainly not rely on it. Now, nobody's actually going to come out and say, you know, we're going to have nothing to do with the dollar. I mean, that was just a, in, invites um, <laughs> calamity upon your head. You don't do that. But through your actions, you quietly drift away from the situation. Yeah. And, mm. and I think that's where we are. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I agree. Yeah. My wife, uh, unfortunately, my wife is not politically knowledgeable, but she said to me this morning, why doesn't America just stick to itself? <laughs> Don't get involved in politics with every other country. And she, uh, it was a probably a good point. But anyway, it's all about domination, Brian. It's all about, yeah, a lot about, a lot about domination. We mentioned some nations here, Brick, Darrell mentioned Brick nations, and uh, my question is going to be relative to, the, to, the, uh, to that subject, the BRIC nations. Um, the US dollar is, uh, from what I can see, uh, Alistair, the US dollar is losing its supremacy with sanctions against Russia. 
backfiring and organizations like the BRICS gaining momentum. I will read out, now I'm going to read out a, uh, a little uh, uh, section here, uh, written by Rashira Sharma, who is chairman of, chairman of Rockefeller International and as a former Morgan Stanley executive, comments on where to, where to from here. So as much as I don't like the Rockefeller family, I'd, uh, I think that's, uh, that's just an organisation in this case, and uh, I won't uh, talk too much about that. But what he says, Sharma warns that the US may have overplaced, overplayed its hand when it launched sanctions against Russia during its conflict with Ukraine. In an interview with France 24, Sharma stated that the US dollar's supremacy has become an issue of concern to many countries. And as a result, they are seeking ways to transact with each other without using the dollar. We've discussed this right now. For instance, Saudi Arabia and China are discussing ways to trade in oil without using the dollar as a medium of transaction. India is having similar discussions with the UAE, exploring how to eliminate the dollar as a denominator. According to Sharma, uh, the central bank holdings of gold are increasing at a pace never seen in history. And central banks from Brazil, India, China and Turkey are buying gold in a significant way. Instead of holding their foreign exchange reserves in US dollars, they are increasingly holding it in gold, which has led to a sharp surge in the price of gold over the past few months. In conclusion, the global movement to end reliance on the US dollar is already underway, with central banks buying gold in a very big way. Leading economies are diversifying their foreign exchange reserves and transacting with each other without using the dollar. According to Rishi Sharma, this trend is likely to continue. My question Will the meeting of the BRICS in late August, as I believe it will happen in late August, about 27th, be the continuation of this trend? And what does it mean for the price of gold? Yes, I think it is a continuation of the trend. Um, it's the BRICS plus story is one that is building gradually. And this next meeting, I think we're going to see some pretty substantial building blocks put in place. Um, everybody is very cognizant that um, you, you know, that when you're moving from um, one geopolitical um, uh, scene, if you like, to another, this is something that you've got to be very careful in doing. Um, and this is why they haven't actually turned their back on the dollar per se. Um, they're effectively saying, well, you know, China, if you want um, to pay us in renminbi for our multi exports, then we'd be happy to accept it. Um, because they can turn around and say, well, you know, we're exporting to China, for goodness sake. <laughs> they say, um, you know, uh, why don't you take our renminbi? And we don't have a problem with that. You know, that's, that's not anti-dollar per se. So, you know, we're walking very, very fine lines here. Um, but there is no doubt that this situation is swinging. I mean, we had a, um, I think, I think it was a French uh, energy, nationalized energy um, entity exporting gas, I think it was, to China, said it was prepared to accept payment in renminbi. Now, that's France, for goodness sake. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, you've also got the whole of Latin America is now sort of drifting in that direction. We've had talks about um, Brazil and Argentina maybe getting together and putting together um, some sort of joint trade currency. This is all vague stuff, admittedly, but you can see that it's all sort of going which way it's, it, it's actually going. As um, proposed, uh, you know, as uh, far as the comments about uh, central banks acquiring gold, um, this is almost exclusively um, a BRICS and Shanghai cooperation organization st story. It's the central banks for those entities who are accumulating gold. Now, also bear in mind that um, while uh, they may acquire gold uh, as official reserves, and that is eventually reported by the IMF, 
the World Gold Council manages actually to get ahead of the curve on that information before it is really given to the IMF in some cases. But also um, uh, countries do accumulate gold for other accounts. In other words, they will have gold, which is not necessarily declared as reserves. Mm. Now, um, it seems to me that we're getting into a situation where, um, you know, there's some evidence for this, I think. We're getting into a situation where with all this buying going on, um, you know, you wonder, uh, are we in a situation where, you know, the amount of physical gold in the world appears to be about 120 or 130 percent of the actual above ground stocks? (laughs) Now, part of the problem is we don't really know what the above ground stocks are. I mean, we can make estimates. Um, Mm -hmm. And uh, actually, James Turk did a very interesting paper quite some time ago uh, looking at the estimates and uh, um, basically concluded, I think, at that time that uh, the above ground stocks were probably about, I don't know, sort of 10, 15,000 tons, if I remember correctly, below uh, what the World Gold Council was saying. Um, so, you know, why is this important? Well, I think the answer to this riddle is that quite a lot of gold is out on lease or swapped or whatever. Now, when you do a lease or a swap, you end up recording under IMF um, uh, recording rules, you end up with two owners and maybe even more. (laughs) (laughs) And uh, what was interesting, and I always refer back to this and, um, you know, because we forget these things, it's just worth remembering that there was a very, very um, uh, astute um, analyst called um, Veneroso uh, who um, looked at this question and spoke to, um, you know, people in the Bank of England on foreign um, exchange side, which includes the management of of gold reserves and so on and so forth, uh, about this whole gold leasing story. And uh, in um, 2002, Frank Veneroso stood up at um, a conference in Lima in Peru and said that his researches indicated that there was possibly up to 10, maybe 14,000 tons of central bank gold reserves out on lease. And a lot of that was probably hanging around the necks of Asian women. So so, now the point is that that 14,000 tons at the time was half the total world gold currency reserves or monetary reserves. Up to half. So he was saying that, you know, up to half could be in that situation. Now, has this changed? No, it hasn't. The the leasing has continued. Now, one thing I would say is that um, a lot of the leased gold hasn't left, um, for example, the vaults of the Bank of England. So it's sitting in the Bank of England, effectively, um, with ledger entries uh, showing the two, two owners for it or two claimants for it. Mm. Now, basically, to just clarify this a little bit for listeners, when you lease something, you retain ownership of that property. It is to be returned to you after the lessee has finished using it. So, um, but um, under IMF accounting rules, um, you know, a lessee can show this in his reserves. Now, you know, you, you might think this is all a bit fanciful, but just sort of remember that uh, the that Germany had enormous difficulty getting back a small part of um, the reserves uh, which it had in uh, the New York uh, Fed. So, um, you know, I mean, the New York Fed was saying, oh, you know, it's going to take seven years to get it back. I mean, what a load of nonsense, complete nonsense. You know, and also there's been anecdotal evidence that every time, um, you know, uh, there's been some sort of problem in the world, like um, Libya, first thing that happens, or one of the first things that happens is the helicopters arrive and take out the gold. (laughs) (laughs) This is, uh, there are sort of credible intelligence reports that this has happened in Libya, and it also happened in Ukraine. Um, So, you know, what the hell's going on? I mean, yeah. I just think that there is a huge, huge shortage of actual gold oh. over what is meant to be earmarked for various nations. 
held in particularly the New York Fed, which is responsible for um, uh, uh, storing gold on behalf of foreign um, countries and their central banks and their treasuries. Um, so, you know, as the dollar blows up, I mean, we could find ourselves in this very interesting situation that, sorry, we got no gold. <laughs> yeah. Or, yeah. 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 Right. Or, uh, you know, I mean, certainly the Netherlands worked very hard, and um, after the debacle on on um, uh, the the uh, uh, German gold, they managed to get everything that they had stored in the New York Fed. They managed to get that back. Um, but you know, you just wonder um, when you get a real financial uh, and a fiat currency crisis, how these yes. are going to fall, uh, and um, if if there really is this sort of problem, then just imagine the panic that's likely to occur uh, as people rush to get gold at almost any price. And this, I think, is, I mean, I'm not forecasting this, but I would say that um, this is a distinct possibility which uh, nobody is talking about. <laughs> nobody wants to. No one wants to talk about it. Correct. So it, it, it this is, I mean, so the, going back to the point you were making, Brian, this is really a situation where, um, you know, the, the sort of the members of BRICS and the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, their central banks, their treasuries accumulating all this gold um, is, I think, um, uh, potentially quite a serious situation because it could well expose this, the lack of actual gold as declared uh, in, in, in the Western alliance. Yeah, I, mean, it, um, I came across this is this is interesting, and I think it's slightly to the point. Some time ago, um, a Finnish friend of mine uh, tipped me off that um, uh, that uh, a lady at the central bank who is responsible for foreign exchange and gold reserves and all the rest of it, on her blog in Finnish, and he translated it for me, uh, said that um, they had sixty-two tons of gold stored at the Bank of England. And they were um, earning uh, good money on it um, by leasing it out. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. so um, I, you know, I I got onto this story, and yeah. um, it wasn't very long before that blog was taken down. You know, oh, sh can't talk about this. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but you can see the problem because yeah. Yeah. what happens is that the Bank of England doesn't necessarily lease out. Um, the UK Treasury's gold, it might do, I don't know. But what it will do is it will act as a, <coughs> as a middleman between, first of all, central banks, uh, you know, requiring gold reserves for whatever reason. And also the major bullion banks um, who require liquidity in the market. And not only that, but the Bank of International Settlements uh, pursues a similar role. So there's been a lot of shenanigans going on in the background of which um, we are not allowed to be aware. Mm -hmm. So this is going to be a story when uh, the financial system actually deteriorates and ends up in, um, you know, in the crisis, which Ray Dalio is forecasting, I'm forecasting, James Turk is forecasting. Um, you know, the, the consequences for the gold price uh, are likely to be absolutely massive. And, you know, that is apart from uh, the collapsing value of fiat currencies driving up the price of gold. This is an additional factor, yeah. which uh, do not be surprised if it happens. Uh, very, very important point to hear. Very important point. And uh, for another point that sort of raises with me is that, We've got the BRIC nations as they stand as it is, which is uh, we most people know is Russia, uh, India, China, South Africa, and Brazil. Now, outside of Brazil, I do know of the other countries that have got have got very good, uh, seem to have very good reserves of gold. I don't know about Brazil, but I, I know the other countries have been building up dramatically. Now, Daryl has mentioned that there's at least uh, another 20 nations wanting to be part of the BRIC nations. Um and I'm thinking to myself, well, to, to actually do the trading, the international trading, where you're trading in your currencies, but each currency has got to be, have some sort of a backing of gold. It's got to be a sound currency. 
So these other 20 nations will have to start from this point onwards, if they already have not started, to build up their gold reserves. So to me, that's just a, a, a format that the price of gold has to go up in US dollar terms very, very quickly, just just to be able to equal out people being out, countries being able to trade well now. And I just, I came across an article from Naomi Prince, and she said, and I've never seen her put a dollar price of gold on any of what she says. I think she's but talking last, three. Yeah, she said, she said a week ago, in her opinion, the price of gold in US dollars will be $3,500 an ounce next year. Now, interesting, she's never mentioned that mm. sort of prices before she has now. So what you're saying, the BRIC nations coming together, Naomi Prince saying 3500 US an ounce. Now, we all know the price of gold. In, that means the US dollar is losing its value so quickly that the price of gold is in such a demand that people will be wanting to spend 3500 US to buy an ounce of gold. That's the way I see it. And um, uh, look, what you're saying, Alistair, I, I mean, we could go on to another question, but we run out of time tonight. Um, the whole, my whole, the whole point of this of this uh, session tonight, or this morning <laughs> in, the, in the UK, is to bring people, alert people that as good as gold, Australia is in huge demand for gold and silver. We used to be quoting two weeks for gold in, in large quantities. Now we're talking four weeks, five weeks for large quantities of gold. Silver is ridiculous, right? You just cannot get it. So my point being here is what Alistair is saying, Nomi Prince is saying, mm. uh, and all of our other people here gone by us, I think it's time. People have woken up, but it's going to be a lot more waking up in the very, very near future. Well, the, the, the old saying, you better get it now because uh, there will become a time where you won't be able to get it. It's clearly come, become yeah. closer. Well, it's be able to get, actually get the ounces as well. The price will be going up. You won't be able to afford it. You will be going to be buying silver, not gold. And at the end of the day, I do believe you should have a good share of both metals because gold is the money, money of kings. It always has been the money of kings. Silver, look, if you wait too long, you won't be able to get the gold. That's it. You agree, Alistair? Uh, it's very hard to disagree with that. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very strong points there, Brian. Good. <laughs> I would add, I, I would add that, um, you, you know, you're not buying gold. You're buying into sound money and dumping credit. Yeah. And uh, now credit normally is fine. Um, if you have credit, which is rarely run between, um, you know, someone who is prepared to give you credit and you're prepared to do the work and all the rest of it. Um, in other words, if credit actually relates to proper economic activity in a free market, it, um, it does not degrade the purchasing power of that credit. Mm. Um, what does degrade the purchasing power of credit is when government gets involved and it starts expanding credit at the central bank level for um, reasons other than um, pure economic um, business activities, if you like. So uh, what we have seen is we have seen a situation where um, basically, you know, sort of the, the, the whole idea of fiat currencies giving governments flexibility to print like bilio, which is what it's turned out to be, is basically destroying the value of all credit in an economy, so that instead of um, uh, commercial bank credit um, having its anchor value uh, through the currency into gold, and therefore, um, you know, we are confident that when we lend money to the bank at, in, in the form of a deposit, the only costs to us are, uh, first of all, the loss of the immediate use of the uh, you know, of 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 the currency, uh, if you like, or the credit. Um, this is if we lend it to them for a period of time, as opposed to having it instant access to uh, 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 instant access, as it were. And the second thing is that obviously there's a counterparty risk factor. Yeah. You know, we would think, well, you know, do we really want to keep it in the bank, sort of thing? And um, you know, what sort of premium should I get, if you like, in return for doing that? Mm. Uh, you know, so 
that that is absolutely fine that's how it works when you've got a proper gold standard because you don't need to hold real money you're confident that mm, yeah. you know that, that that this is soundly based but the moment that the currency becomes unhinged from uh gold from legal money then you've got to start thinking about okay i'm going to lend this money i've been asked to uh, lend money for a year What's going to be the value of that money in a year's time? Now, this is a question people don't often ask. They should no. ask it. <laughs> yes. um, but I tell you one thing, foreigners ask it all the time. Yeah. Because if they're going to hold um, deposits in a foreign currency, this suddenly becomes extremely relevant. And they yes. look at it, in, you know, yep. maybe in the context of... Um, you know, compared with a deposit in my currency sort of thing. So it's not a straightforward situation, but you can see that foreigners are a lot more aware um, that, uh, you know, holding uh, foreign currency could involve lots of purchasing power if um, it is some time before that is returned to you. And this, I think, is really the problem now because more and more central banks around the world um, are moving into real money, real legal money. Why? Well, for very good reasons. They understand the credit problem more than anyone else. Yeah. But of course, there is a complex uh, issue in this one. And that is, they're so keen on gold, they don't want to give, uh, give it to us, their citizens. And so, yes. <laughs> that is the next step of persuasion. But so what what you can do now, I think someone said, be your own central bank. Um, uh, yeah, don't hold dollars, don't hold euros, don't hold, dare I say, Australian dollars, but hold gold. The yeah. gold reserves are the only reserves which make any sense whatsoever at this time. Fantastic. Yeah, well, 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 well look, you know, T Charlie Jones, and we always refer to this, uh, you know, Charlie said many years ago, and unfortunately he's passed on, but Charlie would say in 10 years' time, you're going to be in exactly the same position that you're in right now, apart from two things. People you meet, the books you read. And tonight is a wonderful illustration of that. I mean, whoever would be listening, whoever will be viewing this interview uh, in a couple of nights' time, uh, is just going to get some really powerful information from a gentleman by the name of Alastair McLeod. And... <laughs> Alastair continues to provide this information to the world, right? And you can pick up on this. It is available to you. And so if you want to expand yourself, if you want to go on and do things, just achieve more, learn more, then you need to listen to people like Alastair. Uh, and it's so essential, isn't it? Absolutely. Absolutely. But this guy... Charlie Jones was 100% correct. Mm. People you meet in the book to read. Yeah. That changes your life, doesn't it? It certainly does because yep. it educates you, you know. Yep. Um, just just um, finishing, uh, Peter Daniels is our, our lifetime mentor. Mm. Um, Peter has just given us so much information and training over the years. But Peter would always say, I do not care what poorly executed economic decisions are being made in the world tonight. And there were some pretty poorly executed decisions made the other night with <laughs> with reference to uh, the, 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 the the new debt, yeah. the new debt, right? <laughs> so he doesn't care because he owns gold, and enough of it to place him in in a very enviable position because he has his life and his financial life in control. Mm -hmm. um, he's not allowing anybody else to dictate the terms. He has full control. And Alistair's right with the, um, of course, the central banks. Just do it, the central banks too. They all own gold. Yep. We know why. Right. So just do the same thing. Yep. Learn from them. Just buy it before it starts to get too dear. Yep. And that's it. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, It'll I'll... never get too dear, Brian. <laughs> that's not the point. No, the point is that it's currency not. going down, not gold you going up. You got me out. Absolutely. Absolutely, Alistair. 100% correct. Um, but thank you so much again, Alistair. Really appreciate your support uh, with this channel. And uh, look, we obviously look forward to our next interview with you. Um, 
Until until next time, all of us stay well, stay focused, and goodbye for now. Goodbye for now.